I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. While immigration reform is shaping up to be a top issue of President Obama's second term, little attention has often been played to the individuals at the center of that story. The millions of immigrants, many from Latin America, who come to the United States, their stories often go untold. A new radio program is attempting to change that. It's called Radio Ambulante. The new podcast gathers compelling stories told in Spanish from around Latin America and the United States, using a network of journalists from around the hemisphere. The monthly program fills a gaping hole in the radio landscape for Spanish speakers. The novelist Daniel Alarcón is the show's executive producer. In 2007, I published a novel about radio, and the BBC asked me to do a documentary about Andean migration to Lima, the city where I was born. I was really excited to do this, and I got to travel all over the country and hear these amazing stories. When we did the final edit, a lot of the voices were translated into English, and I thought something was lost. Years later, my wife and I decided to do something about it. We'll be joined in a few minutes by Radio Ambulante's founder and executive producer, Daniela Lorcon, and by producer Annie Carial. But first, I want to turn to one of the stories from their show. It was read live during a recent public performance. It takes place in Tijuana, the world's busiest border crossing. Producer Alexandra Guidi tells the story, which begins with her search for a U.S. border guard named Angelica Decima. When I find her, she's straight-faced and a little nervous, wearing the official navy blue of Customs and Border Protection. I've come to learn about what she does, what this border looks like to her. She must be baking beneath this unforgiving sun. All right, so we'll just head out. We're going to follow you guys. We'll probably be about 10 feet away from you as you do your job. She's not going to interview you or anything like that. Technically speaking, we're still in Mexico, but there's no question who's in charge of this part of the border. Angelica and I are facing the U.S. Behind us, the endless rows of idling cars ex extend deep into Tijuana. To our right, the long, orderly line of pedestrians heading the same direction. We walk a few steps behind another officer and his guard dog, zigzagging our way through the cars heading into San Diego. The smoke and the heat radiating from the engines is making me nauseous. Okay, let's go. Go ahead, you guys. Run, we'll just follow you. 915. Looks like we have aliens smuggling. Then I hear one of the agents calling out the number 915, and this, it turns out, is at least part of the reason for the traffic jam. 915, that's code for human smuggling. A couple of other guards rush past us, the guard dog leading the way. Angelica and I race after them, and we come to an old Honda Accord being driven past a booth by a U.S. guard. The middle-aged man who was at the wheel is staring down at his feet while another guard leads him away from the car in handcuffs. My interview with Angelica had barely begun, and now this. You see this every day, people trying to come into the country hidden in the trunks, um, and even deeper concealment methods, like a uh, special, specially built compartment. Um, a lot of times we call them coffin compartments, like people cannot get out of them, uh, and it is dangerous. To say that it's dangerous is an understatement. It's a rectangular box made up of pine wood planks and metal sheets held by wires and rigged to the undercarriage of this old car. It's so low to the ground, it must have been banged up so many times along the ride. Yeah, they've been in there for a while. I'm with Angelica and about a dozen other guards, and we're all gathered around the old cream collared Honda. Everyone's eyes are on that trunk. And one of the guards, a young Latino guy with a heavy build and jet black, intense eyes, reaches into it and deeper still into the makeshift compartment underneath it. I stop breathing for a moment and look around. We're all staring shamelessly, as if trying to predict who or what will come out. The young guard grabs onto a hand ever so carefully and then pulls out the whole arm. Then the shaking and sweaty body of a kid, probably 15 or 16. He has indigenous features and a skinny, long body. He looks terrified, and my heart sinks as we make quick eye contact. He's not saying a word, but then again, what could he say? The Honda's engine is still running, spewing smoke right into our faces. Then the guard reaches in again. And again, and then again, three more people come out of this tiny space, an absolutely impossible number emerging from under this car. 
four people in all. A second young man and two girls probably in their teens. They have no shoes, no IDs or bags of any kind, just bodies, scarcely alive from the looks of them. Who knows how long they've been stuck in traffic inside this wooden box. Angelica seems desensitized by the whole thing. The first thing. time I found somebody in the trunk, I think I was more nervous than, than the driver. I mean, you're looking for it, um, but it's, it's shocking the first time you actually find people in the trunk. I can imagine this is my first time seeing someone in a trunk, and I feel nothing else but helplessness, shame, and sadness. I mean, I know this happens every day at the border for many years, but it's different when you see it. Oftentimes when people have been in the trunks of the vehicle, especially on a hot day in the summertime especially, um, oftentimes they can be in that vehicle for hours at a time and they come in uh, kind of looking like these folks. These folks are looking tired, hot, sweaty, dehydrated. Sometimes Angelica tells me they're pulled out unconscious. Though I try, of course, I'm not allowed to talk to the girls and boys who've just been taken from the coffin compartment. They're lined up on the curb, still shoeless, and they won't meet my gaze. Moments later, they're taken away. I've worked on the border on and off for years, long enough to know that as soon as they're sent right back, they'll pull all their energy and whatever little money they can get into crossing again. And because I've talked to so many people on this side, men and women who've made the same crossing, I know this too. If they keep trying, they're likely to make it. That was producer Ruxandra Guidi of the new podcast, Radio Ambulante. While the show's podcasts are in Spanish, they occasionally produce stories in English. For more, we're joined by its co-founder and executive producer, Daniel Alarcón, also an acclaimed author. His most recent novel is Lost City Radio. His next novel, due out this fall, At Night We Walk in Circles. He's a fellow in the investigative reporting program at UC Berkeley School of Journalism. Um, we we welcome you to Democracy Now. Thank it's you. great to have you with us. Um, it is hard to put down Lost City Radio, and your I attended uh, your event here in New York as you unveiled um, Radio Ambulante. Explain first what, why Ambulante. An, an Ambulante is a, is a, a kind of a street vendor. Um, is someone who pushes a cart, someone who's out on the streets selling. There's a lot of th things about the ambulante that we feel uh, uh, is symbolic and representative of, of the Latino experience. One, you see them in every Latin American city and in every American city that, that has a, a sizable Latino population. For us, el ambulante is dynamic, is a go-getter, um, you know, is on the streets, hears the stories of his neighborhood and of his people. And um, so when we were trying to think of a name, we went through maybe 300 names. That was one of the really difficult uh, parts of the process, just trying to, what, what you're going to name your baby. Um, which you're about to have. Which I'm about to have. <laughs> your so. first baby. <laughs> yeah, so my first baby would be Radio Ambulante, my second baby. <laughs> um, and we, uh, it, was, it, was a, it was a terrible process. But when we hit on Ambulante and the idea of this, you know, dynamic figure in the, in the community um, who doesn't take no for an answer, you know, you don't find work, you make work, uh, we really like that. And... Uh, who's trying to translate it to like radio on the move also, you know, because he's, he's always out there. And, and the, the, and the uh, idea of just being able to tell the stories uh, uh, by radio, uh, especially the, um, the, that particular medium, why you think it's so important to get the stories out well, that way? Well, Latinos listen to so much radio. You know, radio is a part of Latin American life. It's a part of, you know, in every household, the radio's on all the time. Um, and also the, the new technologies have made radio uh, kind of given a radio a new life. You know, it used to be if you didn't hear it live, it was gone. And now radio is archivable and searchable. Um, we can, you know, draw sounds, you know, from all over the world and then push them back out. So we've been listened to in 120 countries. You know, I can look on the analytics of my website and see that we've got downloads from all over the world. And, um, and that, that's very exciting. And, you know, being a writer, coming from the world of literature, um, Radio is what most, what most closely approximates the experience of reading, um, the experience of having an author and a voice whispering in your ear. So the, the intimacy of radio is, is something that's, that's pretty unparalleled. Tell us about your novel, Lost City Radio, how that fits in. Well, I, I, I see now that it fits in. You know, uh, I, I think, you know, my, my family is a radio family. My, my father was a radio announcer. 
uh, in his youth before he you know went on to do other things. Um, I have uncles and cousins who've worked in radios uh, all over Peru. Um, and for, for me, you know, I, I sort of became obsessed with one program called uh, Busca Personas, People Finders, in Peru. That was basically a way, it was like a public bulletin board, uh, a radio bulletin board every Sunday night for people to find their, their missing loved ones. Um, and it struck me as kind of a symptom of these growing Latin American cities, um, economic dislocation, political violence, you know, all these forces that are moving people into these giant urban centers where they might not be able to connect with their families and loved ones. Um, and I just took that show and created a universe around it. This woman who becomes the voice of a nation, and particularly around the the disappeared. Particularly around the disappeared, yes, in one particular story. The, the novel opens when a boy uh, named Victor, who's around 11 years old, shows up at the radio station and has a list of all the people who've gone missing from his village. And there's one particular name on that list that that shocks her. And so the story is really... How did that name wind up on that list? And in the present tense, it's maybe a day and a half, two days with the woman and the boy. Um, but to tell the story of how the name wound up on that list, we have to go back and tell the history of the war itself. Thanks so much for watching this report from Democracy Now!, your daily independent global news hour. We don't accept advertising or corporate funding, but rather rely on donations from viewers like you. Please make your contribution by visiting democracynow.org. We need your support today to keep bringing you this hard-hitting, in-depth reporting.